أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من ولاه ويس الله سبحانه وتعالى to help us recognize the truth and help us follow it and to help us recognize the falsehood and help us avoid it ويس الله سبحانه وتعالى to make the best of our deeds the last ones that we do and the best of our days the day we shall meet him السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته you know talking about the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام is one of the most enjoyable things I know growing up, this was one of my favorite, if not probably my favorite topic, hearing about him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise him more than he praised anybody else. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise his words. الْهَوَى He doesn't speak out of his own desires. Allah praise his character. You have a great character. Allah praise his heart. And Allah praise his path. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ Then indeed you have the greatest example for anyone who's seeking Allah in the last day. So that's a conditional statement in there. If your goal is Allah in the last day, your best example is the Prophet If your goal is something else, the Prophet may not be your best example. And I think this is really what we're looking for. See, if you're talking about here, I think the main theme of the convention is steadfastness and perseverance. If you're looking at that, of course, the best example is the Prophet You know, the message came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also the way the message was conveyed also came out of a revelation. So the Prophet did follow a specific methodology, a specific manhaj, a curriculum in conveying his message. And it is really important for looking actually to repeating the success that he had to follow the same manhaj. But one thing that is really important to keep in mind is that when we're trying to follow the prophetic model, it does not mean repeating the same image of Medina. This will never happen. You know, the Medina example will never be repeated, by the way, because the generation of the companions, alayhim alayhim will never be repeated. You know, it was not actually repeated even in the time of Ali radiallahu anhu. You know, of course, it was best during the time of the Prophet alayhi wasalam, and that was extended during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar. But then the problem started when the fiqh fitna actually happened toward the end of the Khilafah of Uthman. And then came the Khilafah of Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And then somebody asked Ali ibn Abi Talib, you know, some people are very negative. <laughs> And he told them that how come everything was smooth and nice at the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, but there were so many troubles during your time. And Ali told him, because Abu Bakr and Umar were leading people like myself, but I'm leading people like you. That's really what happens. So the example of Medina will not be repeated. Now that does not mean that what I'm saying is that the prophetic period is irrelevant. Of course not. But what we should be looking for instead is to look at the principles that the Prophet ﷺ established Islam on and then try to use them and adapt them into our own environment. You know, this is the area that is called Fiqh al sirah by the way. And there are many books along that line. So the Prophet ﷺ in conveying the message, he followed a certain methodology, a certain, again, curriculum. One thing that you can see very clearly is that the Prophet ﷺ did what we say, putting the first things first. In other words, establishing that which is important first as the foundation of the whole religion. How many years were uh, spent in, Med in Mecca actually for the revelation? How many years of revelation were there? That was a question. How many? 23 is the total. 13 in Mecca, and then 10 in Medina. So more than half were in Mecca. And if you look, the emphasis during the Mecca period was one thing, which is the belief in La ilaha illallah. Everything else was basically built on that. So for 13 years, that reality, the Prophet ﷺ established in so many different ways. But this was the focus. You know, the do's and don'ts, the tashri'ah came after the migration in Medina, not in Mecca. That's why once that reality was established for 13 years, more than half the life of the revelation, and the Prophet migrated, then came the do's and don'ts. But when the do's and don'ts came, 
the Sahaba alayhim dwanillah were ready for that. In other words, they had already submitted to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the commands came down. Because now they know who's giving the commands, right? That's why, for example, when the ayah of hijab came down, it says after dhuhr, by asr, everybody was covered up. When the ayah came down about alcohol being prohibited, everybody stopped. No matter who it is, it said everybody actually stopped. You have programs today that deal with addiction and alcohol, but in the environment of Medina, it was stopped with a word. Allah says, Avoid it. And everybody did because now they knew actually who's saying, don't do it. And I think this is one of the most important characteristics of the manhaj of the Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing actually the foundation, building the foundation. Once the foundation is built, everything else actually is possible. Few specifics. The Prophet ﷺ, in establishing that foundation, there were some specifics that he followed. You know, when you look at the Sahaba ﷺ, you'd be really amazed. Though how could there be so many great people at the same time in the same place? There was nothing like that in history. In other words, there may have been afterward some people that have achieved a comparable caliber of the Sahaba, but there was never ever that many of them in the same place at the same time. What was the secret? What, did made, what made them as great as they were? Now here some of the scholars mentioned three qualities actually. But the important thing to remember is that it can be repeated. Maybe not as many, but it can be repeated. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ died, it means the message was completed. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant for Islam to be the message until the end of times. Which means, once the message is completed, the physical presence of the Prophet ﷺ is not needed anymore. So long as we have his guidance. If we have his guidance, his physical presence, Islam can still actually fulfill its intent. Even in the physical absence of the Prophet ﷺ, so long as we have his guidance in our hands, which we do. So what made the Sahaba as great as they were? Talking about establishing the foundation first. The first thing, of course, the presence of the Prophet ﷺ as a murabbi. The first thing is that the Prophet ﷺ was keen from the beginning that what formed the belief and the idea and the understanding of the Sahaba was the Quran and the Quran alone. In other words, nothing else. Of course, the guidance of the Prophet is a reflection of that, but nothing else actually until the foundation was established. That's why in the early days of Islam of Umar, when Umar became Muslim, in the early days he was looking through sheets from the Torah. And the Prophet got very upset at him. And he said to him, Ya Umar, Wallahi, if Musa and Isa were among you, they will not be saved except by following me, by following the Prophet ﷺ. Means the foundation has to be the Quran. And then once the foundation is established, then you go. Sky's the limit. You take whatever you want. You read whatever you want it. But then only after the foundation is established, let me show you two situations, mention two situations. Imagine someone whose belief and everything that he sees the world through is the Quran. And then afterward, when something comes in, if it fits, he will accept it. He will accept it if it fits in the Quran. Imagine that where the foundation is the Quran itself versus someone who reads all kinds of books that form his belief and the Quran is just one of them. There's a huge difference between the two. Because the first one actually sees things the way the Quran defines them. The second one actually the Quran is just one of the factors. So the Prophet ﷺ was very keen that the Sahaba ﷺ, their belief is based on that one source and that one source alone. Once that source is established, then go. The wisdom is the goal of the believer. Whatever he finds it, he's most deserving of it. But only after the foundation is established. The second factor. When we read the Quran, this is one of the scholars, what he said. When we read the Quran, we read it to enjoy the beautiful words, the beautiful language, 
if you're into that. The beautiful stories, the beautiful imagery, the descriptions, the eloquence of the Quran, the miraculous aspects of the Quran. That's how we read it. But the Sahaba read it with a different attitude. Well, you will ask, well, is there anything better than what, just, what I just mentioned? The words, the language, the Quranic stories, and all of these things. The Sahaba, when they were reading the Quran, they were trying to find out what Allah wants them to do, so they will do it. In other words, we approach the Quran as a book of education. They were approaching it as a book of instructions. There's a huge difference between the two. The education will come, but only after the basic actually are met. In other words, when they read in the Quran, this is, these are the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to me. Allah is giving me command and I will do it. And this is what the Quran is meant to be, by the way. That's what the Quran was revealed over 23 years. He did not come just down at once. Here, take this book and study it the way you study you know, philosophy, the way you study history. This is not what the Quran is meant to be. The Quran is a book of guidance, of instructions. Imagine, for example, somebody, an army commander, addressing his soldiers, and then some soldier saying, you know, oh, he's a good speaker. Oh, look at that. I really like the way he spoke. I like the way, you know, he did this. Well, this is not the reason he's talking to you about. He's giving you instructions. And the same thing when we're talking about the Quran, these are the words of Allah, the very words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. So when we read them, Allah is telling us something, what we should believe in, what we should be doing. So our approach to Quran has to be adjusted. Instead of reading it as a book of academic enjoyment, of academic education, to read it as a book of instructions. The third factor. What was the first one? Who, was the, who remembers the first one? Forgot it already? <laughs> it's the oneness of the source, that the foundation has to be the Quran alone. The second one is approaching the Quran as a book of guidance, not as a book of education. The third one is that the Sahaba, alayhim when they became Muslim, they always looked back at their past with fear, with apprehension, fearing that they might fall into their old ways, into their old jahiliyyah. You know, this is true, by the way, for anyone who, whether you revert to Islam or you repent, you make tawbah. To look back at the old days with fear is nothing actually to be proud of. I'm afraid of what I did. I'm afraid that I might fall back into that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got me out of it. I don't want to go back to it. That's why looking back at that with fear. You know, unfortunately, sometimes people almost like brag about their jahiliyyah. Like somebody says, you know, when I was, you know, before Islam, I could do whatever I want. I can get any girl that I want, whatever. But of course, alhamdulillah, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> In other words, to be Islamically correct. No, no, what are you talking about bragging about something that is wrong? The Sahaba, alayhim, when they look back at their past with fear, with disgust, that this is something that I'm afraid of falling back into. You know, imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you of something. Yalla, don't take me back into it after you saved me from it. So the Sahaba would look back, and if they ever actually trip or fall back into their old ways, they would immediately remember and go back. You know, when does, I can talk about myself. I can see that whenever I feel safe and protected, that's when I screw up. That's when I do the wrong. But if I'm always watching my behavior, I'm always attentive to what I do, I'm less likely to do that. And that's what the Sahaba Allah, did. And the Prophet, of course, he was the greatest example that the Sahaba would count how many times the Prophet would say Astaghfirullah in one gathering, 70 times or 100 times. Or the dua of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub wal-absar, israf qulubana ila ta'atik. Allahumma anna nasaluka thabata fil amri kulli. That asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, you change hearts. Keep my heart firm on your straight path. Ya Allah, give us steadfastness in everything. You know, when you make that dua, you're always watching your behavior. Because you don't take anything for granted. I mean, who has a better belief than the Prophet ﷺ did? But yet, 
because actually he had the greatest belief, he was concerned about that. So this third factor, when we're talking about the Sahaba, what made them as great as they were was that attitude of always actually fearing of falling back into their old ways. That's why when something comes down in the Quran, they will not think, well, this may be talking about Basim, you know, or somebody else. <laughs> they will look at it, it's talking about them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayuhal ladhina aman. La tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt al-nabi. Wa la tajharu lahu bil qawli ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'd. An tahbata a'malikum wa antum la tashharun. O you who believe, do not raise your voice above that of the Prophet. And do not shout to him the way you shout to one another. Otherwise, all of your deeds will be wasted and you may not be aware of it. There was one Sahabi, alayhi who naturally had a loud voice. Some people have very powerful chords, mashallah. And he thought, so naturally he had a loud voice. And he was afraid that this may be about me. My voice is very loud in the presence of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he stopped coming to the masjid for fear that it may apply to him. And the Prophet explained to him that this was not. Now the point here is that this was the attitude of the Sahaba alayhim dwanillah. Now, with that, all of the above, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam did not form that or teach that in an isolated environment. You know, of course, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam formed the jama'ah, the group, the ummah, out of individuals. But the Prophet ﷺ also formed the individual within the jama'ah. There was no separation between the two. In other words, there was no period of academic study, so to speak. We studied academically and then we move on to practice. It came together. It happened together. There's no separation. Sometimes we are separated for academic purpose. But this is not the way it happened with the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. That's why you'll find the Quran, first the hadith of the Prophet was always repeating, be with the group, don't be by yourself. Because the wolf eat from the sheep, the, the, from the flock, the sheep that strays away. And if you look actually in the Quran, everybody knows Surah Al-Asr, right? Yes? No? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, Asr, he's swearing, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا that you'll find that when the individual, when the singular is mentioned, when the singular is mentioned, it is mentioned normally in a negative way. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودِ قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَهُ لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ So you'll find that the singular, when it is mentioned, it is mentioned in a negative way. The positive is always mentioned in the plural. Surah Al-Asr. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ Except those. Normally, you can say the other way around. You can say that everybody is lost except the ones. So you take the exception in the few from the many. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the lost in the singular and the exception in the plural, which means if you don't want to be lost, it has to be in the group. This is the way it is mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers Always in the plural, unless it's a specific command to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Ya ayu alladhina amanu, in Surah Al-Hujurat, five times. Always repeating the same expression in the plural. When you pray, you always say, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeen. Even if you're alone by yourself, on the moon, you don't say, ihdini sirat al-mustaqeen. Always ihdina sirat al-mustaqeen. That's why again, my brothers and sisters, just to repeat what I said, when we're talking about following the guidance of the Prophet wasalam, it means looking at the principles that he used and trying to build on the same principles. This way Islam will be applicable to an infinite situation, number of situations. It is not limited to a specific example. So we're not talking about repeating the image of Medina. This will never happen. You know, but we're talking about building on the same principles that the Prophet ﷺ actually used. And in doing so, the Prophet ﷺ first, he made sure that the most important is established, the foundation, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not in an academic way, but in a practical way. 
So we're not talking about something that you read in a book. And the practical way is what the Prophet والسلام, said to Abdullah bin Abbas, a young companion. He said, Ya Ghulam, I will translate inshallah. Inni u'allimuka kalimat. Ihfad Allah yahfadk. Ihfad Allah tajudhu tujahak. Ida sa'alta fas'al Allah. Wa in isti'anta fasta'in billah. Wa'alam anna al-ummah lau ishtama'at ala an yanfa'uka bi shay'i. لم ينفعوك الا بشيء قد كتبه الله لك ولو اجتمعوا على ان يضروك بشيء لم يضروك الا بشيء قد كتبه الله عليك رفعت الاقلام وجفت الصحف so he said to him oh young man i'm teaching you some words listen this is a message not just for the young men but for all of us he said be mindful of allah allah will remember you be mindful of allah you'll find him or you need him if you were to ask ask allah if you were to seek anybody's help Seek the help of Allah. And then know, <coughs> if the whole world unite to benefit you in any way, they will not benefit you except by the will of Allah. And if the whole world unite to harm you in any way, they will not harm you except by the will of Allah. The pens were lifted and the decree were sealed. See, this is the belief in the oneness of Allah, in practical life, in reality. If I believe in that, if I believe in that, nothing else actually would matter. I would not fear anybody. I would not fear anything. Because I believe that it's all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the difficulties come, <clears throat> well, if you excuse me, I'm going <coughs> to... I'm glad that somebody put them there. <clears throat> when the difficulty comes, it will not get to me if my foundation is established. You know, we talk about Muslims going through difficulties and tough times. And sometimes we like to think of ourselves as being unique. Nobody's suffering like I am. Nobody's going through like we are. No, no, the Sahaba went through difficult times. The most difficult thing is after the Battle of Uhud, when 70 of the greatest companions were killed. Imagine Hamza, Abdullah ibn Jubayr, and then many others. But more than all of that, the Prophet himself severely wounded. It doesn't get any worse than that. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last third of Surah Ali Imran. And among the things that Allah has revealed, a great verse, and the whole Quran is great, that tells them what I mentioned earlier. Allah says, وَلَا تَحِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Ya Allah, so beautiful. Allah said, do not be saddened. Do not despair, do not distress. And you are the highest if you are believers. Think about that for a second. Allah does not want the believers just to be patient, but to go beyond actually sabr, beyond patience, into believing that they are the highest. If they are believers, we're not genetically better, we're not ethnically better. What makes us better is the message that we carry. This is it. So long as I have it, I am the highest. If I don't have it, I'm not better than anybody else. But here the point is, that verse that tells the believers that they are the highest came after a defeat, not after a victory. It came down after Uhud, not after Badr. To indicate to the believers that your attitude should not be dictated by situations. It should not matter whether the Muslims have the lower hands or have the upper hands. So long as they are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing else actually matters. This is a source of pride. This is a source of dignity. What Umar alayhi wa said, Wallahi, words that should be written in gold. He said, and I will translate, he said, نحن قوم أعزنا الله بالإسلام فمهما ابتغينا العزة بغيره أذلنا الله He said, we are people that were dignified by Islam. If we were to seek dignity anywhere else, it would only increase us in humiliation. Our source of dignity is only Islam. If I have that, nothing else actually matters. You know? Now, of course, it's difficult. Because if I'm declaring my identity high, there will be discrimination, there will be harassment. All of these things. The only way to get rid of that discrimination is to give up your identity. That's the wrong way, of course. But if you do, you will always be a second class. You will always be an imitation, so to speak. You know, I was reading a great book 
The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Anybody read that book? It's a really great book. But he was talking about himself and when he was young, that how was he was trying basically to, to look white, straightening his hair and all of these things. And he said, I noticed that no matter what I do with the way he was trying to look white, he will always be a second-class white man. And he said, because he's always imitating, he'll never reach. And he says, I don't want to be a second-class white man. I want to be a first-class black man. See, this, this is the attitude. We want to be a first-class Muslim. We don't want to be an imitation to anybody else. If you were to seek dignity anywhere else, and sometimes, unfortunately, <clears throat> we look down on what we have. We look up to what the others actually have that to be a Muslim is to imitate this, to imitate that. La Wallah, what we have is the truth. What we have is the truth. And don't shy away from that. If somebody tells you, oh, it's really strange that you pray. No, it is strange that you don't pray. It is really strange that you guys fast in Ramadan. No, it is strange that you guys don't fast the way we do. It is strange that you're wearing hijab. No, it is strange that you don't wear hijab. The norm... The truth is what we have, not the other way around. So we don't want to measure up to the others. What we have is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us persevere us on His path in this life and in the hereafter. Zakum Allah khair walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.